Good morning. How are we doing today on day three of our uh, symposium? Doing well? <coughs> All right. We have a great topic here today, and we have great panelists. I want to say thanks for joining us today on an important topic. It's transitioning to a wartime posture against a peer competitor. And I'm really honored to be here with some of the thought leaders in industry on this critical topic. As we've all heard throughout the, uh, throughout the week, we are at a pivotal moment in history. The DOD is very clear-eyed about our peer adversary, our peer competition, and the multi-domain threats that it poses. The na our nation has responded with uh, has it responded by advancing the concept of integrated deterrence in our national defense strategy. But should deterrence fail, then what? In this hour, or 40 minutes uh, more, more closely to the target, we're going to talk about what it means for the Department of the Air Force to mobilize its forces at scale, to be ready with a wide range of information systems, facilities and support, to deploy airmen and guardians to the fight, and most importantly, to win in air, in space, and in the cyber domains. So in a word, this panel is all about readiness, the seventh and essential operational imperatives. So with me today, we have experts from industry up here on the stage. Thank you all for joining me. And first up, we have Andre McMillan, who's the Vice President of Sustainment Operations at Pratt & Whitney. So Andre, if you would, please tell us a little more about you and your work. Thank you, General Pringle. And uh, good morning, AFA. It's, it's great to be with all of you, and certainly it's an honor to, to be on the panel. So I lead all of our uh, sustainment activities across all of our portfolio of military engines at Pratt & Whitney. So essentially what that entails is that we're responsible for activating all of the bases, the ships, the depots around the world. We're also responsible for the customer support engineering to support all of our operators and maintainers in the field and in the depot. We also uh, lead a team that's responsible for the support equipment, for the movement of material around the world and to industrialize the repair network. I'll also share, um, I've been with Pratt Winnie for 16 years, so I'm a 16 year industry partner but also continue to serve as an airman, uh, 26 years as a mobilization assistant. And so it's great to be with you this morning. Hey, thanks so much, Andre. So next up to my left, we have Brian Morrison, Vice President, General Manager in Cyber Systems at General Dynamics Mission Systems. So Brian, tell us about yourself. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me, ma'am. Uh, I'm grateful to all of you for coming. Uh, I come to this uh, from a, a little bit of a different perspective, I think, than many of you. I come here with a deep and abiding passion for security and how we can use security to render the fight against our adversaries unfair. I'm not interested in any fair fights, and I know you all aren't either. Uh, so I lead a business uh, focused on cryptography and keys and information security. Um, throughout the department, but with a very heavy focus on the Department of the Air Force, and I'm delighted to talk to you today about readiness. Thanks so much, Brian. Okay, and last and certainly not least, we have David Tweedy, General Manager of Advanced Products at GE Edison Works. David. Uh, thank you, General, and I'm just happy to be here to represent GE, who's been a proud supplier of the U.S. military for over 100 years now, and from the first U.S. jet engine in 1942 to the first three-stream adaptive cycle engine in 2022, and everything in the 80 years in between. Just really proud to with the partnership with, with the U.S. military and, and the Air Force. Um, specifically within my portfolio, I have uh, general manager responsibility for a variety of advanced fighter engine development programs at different phases that's really focused on bringing state-of-the-art technology into our product portfolio both today and in the coming years to bring that capability to, to the warfighter. And again, just excited to be here. Thanks so much. Appreciate you being here. Thank you all. So, uh, so Brian, I'm going to start with you. And let's jump in. Let's uh, talk about the context of readiness and really what it means, what does it mean to you, your company, or your technologies? So I think through decades of the department, we've thought of readiness as are our airmen trained, 
Are our platforms maintained? Um, do we have sufficient ordinance? Do we have sufficient JP5, right? It was really a purely logistical question. And that resonates, I think, with many of us. Uh, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics. But I think that in the world in which we live today, we need to think of readiness as maybe there's a step before all of that, right? Readiness has to include the security of our information, the security of our plans, the security of our orders, the security of our comm systems. Because as we know, our peer competitors are going at that soft underbelly. So that to me is the central principle of readiness. If I made aircraft engines or sustained aircraft, I might feel differently about it. But from where I sit, the key issue in readiness is left of launch, right? It is, can we secure our information before conflict arises and then keep the security of that information during conflict? So it's maybe a little bit of a different view of it than uh, the logisticians in the room, than the uh, engine manufacturers, than the maintainers in the room, but I, I think it is as essential as any other part of readiness I can think of. Does that answer the question, ma'am? Uh, absolutely. And as we're facing multi-domain threats, we have to think about readiness in a multi-domain way. So uh, I think that makes perfect sense. And it kind of leads into my next question, which uh, really I'm going to target at Andre. You mentioned that you, uh, you're a commissioned officer uh, in the military, and you've been in uh, for a while. So. Times have changed, technolo technologies have changed, and so can you tell us uh, how has readiness changed uh, from when you've started to maybe today? Yeah, I think if, as you think about um, kind of what's changed is the fact that we've changed our, our way of thinking from an industrial age mindset to more of a informational age mindset. And what I mean by that is if you were to take a look at and view readiness through the lens of a system, it's not only the technology readiness levels, it's the manufacturing readiness levels, but it's also the digital readiness levels that I think is incredibly important. And so if you look at iPhone as a great example, iPhone was launched in 2007. Here as we sit, they've launched the, in 16 years, 16 versions of an iPhone. And so there's been this desire to continue to have iterative technology insertion along the way. And if you were to look at propulsion, we've done exactly that same. In partnership with the Air Force, who, who really adopted this idea early on with the engine model derivative program. And so as we look at our history with the F-100 that has had several iterations of improvements along the way, we've had the F-118 likewise that has done the same. Many people don't realize that uh, the 119 was, was nicknamed the maintainer's uh, engine. And so it was already, looking at logistics under attack. It was already thinking about a contested environment, and it was already thinking about how is an airman going to be able to utilize and work within a, a hazmat suit, be able to use six common hand tools, remove and replace a line replaceable unit within 15 minutes, and do it in an austere environment. And so we've taken that type of iterative design and technology, and we've built that forward even to the 135. From a digital perspective, you know, I'll share with you that the 135 in one single flight will actually download usable and useful data than what an entire uh, 119 was able to do in one year. And so as you think about uh, how we accelerate change from that perspective, it's, it's, um, it's significant. And so we continue to, uh, to do that. We, we have an engine core upgrade that we're working through now, and we're making sure that it's supportable across the sustainment network, across the globe. So uh, having that uh, digital underpinning and adapting quickly to change is really what is making today today's readiness different than the past. And so uh, that's particularly important as we're looking at the scale of a peer competition and transitioning there. So uh, really great, great uh, words there. So speaking of peer competition, uh, David, if we can, uh, let's, let's talk about China. And they have this concept of military-civil fusion where industry uh, looks 
and everything that they do, they bring those advantages to the military, including its readiness posture. So here in the United States, we have a different model, open society, et cetera. Do you have any thoughts on how we might better benefit uh, from what industry has to offer, or even, you know, as Andre just mentioned, those digital technologies that are out there? Yeah, um, you know, we look at what our competitors are doing with their system. I think we need to step back and look at what are the asymmetric advantages of, of our system. And, and there's a couple that I'll bring up. One, the first one is, is competition. Right? Our free market, private sector system is found, you know, is a, competition is a driver and it provides innovation, uh, it provides affordability, and it provides responsiveness to, to the end user customer. You know, and, and so while the DOD is often the obtainer of bespoke capability and therefore has to often fund during the development phase, and so some of that upfront investment to ensure competition throughout the life cycle might be more upfront, downstream time and time again, both, both in the commercial world and in the military world, the implementation of a, a competitive structure over the life cycle can bring those benefits of innovation, affordability, and responsiveness. And then one step beyond that, I think with recent world events, both with COVID and, and the, the, the uh, challenges in Ukraine have highlighted resiliency in the supply chain. And it's one of those things, you never know how valuable it is until you lose it. And I think that's something over the last three years, we've all collectively recognized how fragile we were in terms of supply chain resiliency. And so that's another sort of intrinsic benefit to competition that's harder to quantify on a dollars and cents basis. But again, it's, it's invaluable once you realize you don't, you don't have it. But then the second thing to bring up is our commercial aerospace uh, industry in the United States. I mean, we're, we're blessed. It is the best in the world, um, and it's actually the largest uh, capital goods export market, which sets a very strong, uh, for the United States, so it sets a strong foundation for our economy, which is intrinsically beneficial to our country. Uh, but then that provides some technologies and capabilities that can be leverageable in. It provides an infrastructure, whether that's unique manufacturing capabilities as well as industrial capacity, right? The commercial aerospace market is larger than the military aerospace market. So tapping into that brings that industrial benefit as well as the workforce. I mean, we heard from Secretary Kendall, you know, that the airmen uh, are, are the critical to the success of the Department of the Air Force. Well, our skilled workforce, both our, our engineers, uh, our salaried and hourly manufacturing workforce, it, it's a tremendous asset to this country. So now how do you get more of those products into the Department of Defense space and how do you get more of those commercial players into the defense world? And, and just a couple thoughts. Um, you know, commercial off-the-shelf procurement, is an obvious way to do that. You know, one thing we sometimes see is you start with something that's almost what you want, that's commercially available, and then as you start applying unique requirements for unique military needs, each of those individual requirement de de decisions in a vacuum might make sense, but w in aggregate, you might have marched so far away from the original commercial off-the-shelf intent that you're giving up the cost and the economies of scale and what you're really after, and you drive more cost, higher qualification costs. So maybe just, it doesn't work in all cases, but adjust the lens a little bit from how do I tailor the commercial off-the-shelf product to my unique military requirements to maybe flip the script a little bit is, can I tailor my military requirements to align with what the commercial world is producing and maybe live with a, um, you know, not perfect technical requirements, but good enough technical requirements, but then give you that affordability and scale that you're looking for to provide readiness. And then finally, IP, I think there's a great structure for commercial items, there's a great structure for bespoke items, but some of the players, if you're a small business with a very narrow but very valuable IP, and that's the center of your business, when you put that at risk, that's, you're risking your whole company, right? And, and then if you're a more large commercial-oriented business, wanting to get into the commercial world, how much of that are you willing to put at risk? So I think there's, in that in-between zone of pure commercial versus pure military, is there an IP structure that can get more players on the field? And it's not an a insurmountable barrier, but it's a speed bump that, that might be preventing fully tapping into that asset we have. So if I were to summarize uh, kind of what you were, you know, just uh, helping us understand, intellectual property, uh, the talent, the people that actually make it all happen, and then looking at the requirements uh, in order to do it at scale. Uh, are there ways that we can 
uh, get good enough, uh, min viable product, if you will. So I uh, really like uh, all that discussion. You also mentioned something that's near and dear to my heart uh, as a lab commander. We're constantly focused on, you know, what if, uh, what if we don't know what the threat is that's out there and we have to adapt to the unknown and COVID was the absolute perfect example. So you rely on the talent to converge in a multidisciplinary way and solve that in uh, new and different ways than what you might not have thought. And so that makes readiness a whole different aspect. So Andre, I'm gonna come back to you and see, you know, have you learned anything? What, what did your company employ throughout uh, the pandemic? And are there lessons learned that we might apply to uh, our readiness posture? Thank you for the question. I think if you look back over the last couple of years, um, we've learned a very valuable lesson because the pandemic clearly was a great equalizer that affected every city, every county, every country, every continent. And, but it was at the same time the natural force and function in many respects that actually brought us together when we needed to be together the most. And so I, I'll look at the lens of, um, of our partnerships, specifically our public-private partnership, which we have down at Tinker Air Force Base. I'll share with you that during the last couple of years, uh, despite the fact that we had workforce disruption, despite the fact that we had supply chain disruptions and everything else that was going on, that location across three uh, engine series, the F-119 that powers the F-22, the F-135 obviously, as well as the C-17 engine, in two years they were able to increase their output year over year and it was the highest they've ever actually had ever done, and they did it during a pandemic. And then you would say, well, why, why is that? And I think in many respects, we were able to develop the right level of partnership that was required. We were able to move at the speed of trust, and we actually brought that same focus as we uh, increased our capacity across the international uh, sector. We actually have 36, 26 bases, 10 ships that we stood up Within a couple of years, it'll be 74. I had a team that actually built uh, three test cells in three continents and still had to deal with uh, quarantining for, for two weeks at a time in the countries that they were at. So it just kind of shows you that despite uh, the distractions and the disruptions that we have, that there's still a way to be able to, to partner together. I'll share one more that actually hits closer to home is uh, obviously uh, General Pringle being the commander of the Air Force Research Lab. This year, we'll actually sign a, a data sh sharing teaming agreement with them. And it's in an effort to be able to support digital threat for sustainment. And so we decided to partner with them on how do we look at flight safety, critical hardware, and how do we actually utilize the data mesh that's there and accelerate it in a way that we can actually not only be able to come up with advanced repairs, but also maybe potentially look at different types of materials and this is all in an effort to be able to leverage the statement and then more so leverage the network that we have across the globe to support our products. Uh, thank you, Andre. So as we uh, become more involved and or dependent or integrated in a digital way, uh, we're gonna have to start to think about, or well, hopefully we've thought in advance about securing that and our communication strategy and cybersecurity. And so, Brian, uh, this kind of brings me to you and a question for you about, uh, you know, what steps can we take uh, to be better prepared, but whether it's with our cybersecurity or our communication strategy for airmen and guardians? So, I think as an initial matter, what I worry about, and I, I think many of you worry about, is that we're coming off a couple of decades of conflict in which all of our comms were essentially secured, right? We were not competing with a peer. Um, and I think most of us in the room believe the next conflict will be quite different from that. Um, and I worry that maybe we have lost some of the fire in the belly in worrying about how to keep those comms secure. So look, in every circumstance, whether it's your laptop at home or the iPhone in your pocket or the IFF system in your aircraft, uh, in every circumstance, the first question is always about updates and patches, 
right? We have seen over time that most of the penetrations we've had have not been unbelievably sophisticated attacks. They've been known exploits or exploits of known vulnerabilities that we had the means and the knowledge to remediate. So the first thing I think we all have to think about all the time is are we doing our, what I would call sort of cyber hygiene? It's a funny turn of phrase, but I, I think it makes sense. Are we doing the eating our vegetables from an information security perspective? Um, the second thing I think we need to keep in mind is that the United States Air Force and the United States Space Force has largely solved many of the most thorny problems of warfare for the past five centuries. We now can deliver a weapon system anywhere in the world within minutes with near 100% accuracy and near 100% lethality, right? That was unthinkable for most of human history. And now it's thunk, right? We can do it and we know we can do it. Unfortunately, our peer adversaries know we can do it. So they will, by necessity, pursue those asymmetric attacks, which have to be attacks on our information systems, right? So what that requires us in turn to do is think like the enemy. And I know there are no doubt planners and red teamers probably in this very room who make their living thinking like the enemy. We've got um, hundreds of pen testers um, in my business who sort of think every day, how can we break what we're doing? Um, so we gotta think like the enemy, and then we've got to devote the time, treasure, and attention to stay ahead of the obsolescence curve, particularly in my part of the world at General Dynamics Mission Systems with codes and crypto. So that's not just a military issue. It would also be one in uh, industry as well, right? Oh, Do you have any thoughts on you that? You know, David said something I loved. He said, our asymmetric advantage is our competition. Um, and I think that's a wonderful response to the sort of unity of effort you can get in a totalitarian country, right? Um, I, I totally agree. I think our competition will allow us to respond to that unity of effort. The challenge is that, again, our enemy knows that we are more innovative, that our technologies develop faster, so they're stealing it left, right, and center. So that's the industrial base threat is, how do we keep them from, from stealing our mittens, so to speak? And you know they're trying, we know they're trying, um, and we see it every day, you know, OSI warns us all the time, our own internal security departments warn us all the time. But so while I, I totally agree with David that our innovation can get us out of this box, we've also got to protect our innovation. 100% yeah. agree with that. Well, yeah, jump in. Please don't, uh, please don't be shy. It's a, it's a great topic. Uh, so David, um, let's, let's Pull the thread a little bit more, you know, how can industry be better prepared, whether it's in this area or uh, as we're talking about this transitioning to a wartime posture, right? So we are talking at scale and mass and that's, uh, and speed, obviously. We can't get there soon enough. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, a, a few things, you know, we're working on at, at General Electric. Um, you know, we've been through, as well as all of industry, a, a massive supply chain disruption through COVID. Uh, and so as we really try to get you know, back to where we need to be to deliver for our customers, both commercial and military, we're really trying to attack with lean principles, um, really trying to drive waste out of the system and focus on SQDC, safety, quality, delivery, cost, in that order. Um, because you've got to attack them in that order if you want to get to the ultimate result. And whether it's, and also driving a culture of continuous improvement. Kaizen is the, the lean term for that. And that's both internally in our own shops as well as in, in close partnership with a lot of our, our tier one suppliers um, where we work collaboratively with them to go through you know, week-long Kaizen events and try to, to drive improvements. And we've seen um, in our own shops up to a 70% 70 improvement in turnaround time in our HPT blade manufacturing product lines. 
uh, with some of our suppliers, we've seen a 30% improvement in throughput, and that's just making better use of the assets that you already have. You know, another approach for us is strong synergies between our commercial technologies and our military technologies. For GE specifically, that's ceramic-based uh, composites material systems that are lighter weight, more durable, higher performing, and additive manufacturing, 3D printing. Uh, we've uh, actually did a lot of pioneering technology work with the Air Force Research Laboratory on those technologies, but then our high volume commercial products have industrialized those, gone through the regulatory hurdles, and are now flying you know, millions of people every day on those technologies that then get fed back into our T901 uh, turboshaft engine for the Army uh, future attack uh, reconnaissance aircraft, as well as the XA100 that we worked in close partnership with the Air Force on that, that can revolutionize and maintain the, the air dominance function of the Air Force. Um, so that's, you know, as, as we think of things. And then just one specific example that caught our attention yesterday was Secretary Kendall talking about a thousand CCA, collaborative combat aircraft. And, you know, we need to collectively, industry and the government think through the problem we're asked to be solved, we're, the problem we're being asked to solve is the, the Air Force can't afford the exquisite capability of the manned platforms and the volume required. So CCA is the solution, but if we do nothing more than just take off the systems that are there to support the pilot, I don't know that we're gonna break the cost curve enough to get to the volume you'd like. So how do we think through, again, the requirements process through design, qualification, and even the whole sustainment approach, how do we rethink that collectively as industry and government to get to a true low cost solution, not just a slightly lower cost solution? So those are the, I don't have the answers, but that is some of the things we're trying to think about and wanna partner with, uh, uh, with the Air Force on. Well, and you know, it kind of even brings up the other question of, um, you know, kind of a dual use uh, military technologies that meet military or civilian needs. Do you have any thoughts on that? So would that be a way to better break the cost curve? Absolutely. It speaks right at the heart of are there commercially available alternatives that are good enough or close to good enough that, that again, when you think about the industrial, but first of all, products that might already be developed as well as industrial capacity that might already exist that can be quickly repurposed um, as different customers have, have shifting needs over time. And, yeah, go ahead. Please, Audrey. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, and I, I think there's some similarities there with a blended business of having commercial and uh, military. And many folks don't realize that 75% um, of, our, of our business is actually commercial, so we do think heavily about uh, where do we leverage the technology to include the, the actual product? So as you look at CCA and, and the, other, um, the other topic that was brought up yesterday was this blended wing concept regarding the future tanker and, and what's the staple of commercial off-the-shelf products that we actually have and they're actually available. So there's, it actually accelerates the time for uh, insertion and then it also provides an opportunity to, to partner with their framers from an integration standpoint. So I think there's great benefits there from an affordable readiness perspective. And any thoughts in the cyber world? Is it different? Um, it is, and I, I'll disagree with my friends just a tiny bit um, as it relates to my domain, which is different, admittedly. It's a, it's a different world. Um, in the cybersecurity domain, the notion of just good enough or almost good enough to me is a recipe for mission failure, right? In the cybersecurity domain specifically, the notion that we can get almost there with uh, commercial crypto um, is obviously uh, a non-starter for our most critical missions. Of course, there are missions in which you can rely on some commercial crypto because you've got uh, a short lifetime for the uh, Data security. Maybe somebody doesn't like what I'm saying, <laughs> well, man. Well, or they really like it. <laughs> or they want me to get off the stage. I don't know. Um, we have for our most minutes. crucial missions, though, we have to be dealing with gear that only, only the U.S. military and its closest allies have. Um, it's just our lives depend on it. Well, uh, great thoughts, and, you know, uh, apparently it was enlightening. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Well, uh, we... You, Done. We have, uh, as we wind down our discussion, uh, let's finish with, um, so we've, let's assume we've transitioned to this wartime posture, we've, um, you know, collected our capabilities at scale, our airmen and guardians are prepared and ready. 
So uh, how do we continue to adapt uh, while we're in the middle of uh, fielding these challenges, addressing the threat, et cetera? And uh, that'll be the last question, then we'll uh, go to closing comments. So David, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think in, in two kind of work streams, I think in kind of like the uh, um, you know, cold conflict of ongoing, right, as our capabilities evolve, we, our understanding of our competitors' capabilities evolve. I just think the continued close partnership between industry and, and the military and understanding where those emerging needs are is, is the way to address that. And then I think in more of the hot conflict, it's about having the right products at the right time and that ability to surge uh, capacity with, with very short notice, which I think we've all learned is, is harder than, than, than a lot of people anticipated. So um, I think it's about being prepared and perhaps thinking, you know, different from a just-in-time approach that a lot of us in both commercial and on the military side have migrated to, to what does a just-in-case posture look like um, and how do you set up yourself for that? Yeah, I think that's a really good point because we don't want to just uh, only plan for up to day one and then wing it after that. We've, we've got to be prepared day two to day 200. Okay, uh, any thoughts, Andre? Sure, I, I think um, I go back to yesterday, the chief shared uh, the quote from a Italian Air Marshal, Julio De Hay, and um, it, it certainly resonated with me, and it's a quote that I've shared with the team uh, in previous times, and, and basically it says, that victory smiles upon those who anticipate the change in the character of war, not upon those who adapt themselves after the change occur. And I think what we bring to the fight is our, our ability and our approach to be able to solve problems with our customer. And so as I think back to um, kind of Francis Pratt and Amos Whitney history, a lot of people don't realize that they were integral in providing um, interchangeable parts during the Civil War. And so that's kind of where the history's gone. And then in World War II, uh, with the scale that was required for both the Navy and the uh, Army Air Corps, we were able to provide that. And then as I think, and fast forward to even now, uh, and much more so we're able to leverage the power of Raytheon Technologies, uh, which is the, uh, our parent company, and, and clearly there's a portfolio of technologies, but then I would also say there's 180,000 people that are working shoulder to shoulder with our, with our customers. So when you think about that and our ability to do things together and partner, uh, I think it's gonna be critical as we, uh, as we go forward to be able to adapt in a peer competition, peer competitive environment. Thanks, Andre. Brian? So I love what you said about partnership. Um, I'll quibble with your premise a little bit, ma'am. I, I think, so the question um, was premised on the notion that we will one day move from uh, a peacetime footing to a wartime footing. In my part of the world, ma'am, I believe we are there. And if there's one thing that really keeps me up at night, I believe we are in hot conflict today in the cyber domain. And I know many of you agree with me. And if we are in hot conflict today, I assure you that those two or three peer adversaries are working every day to break our codes, to get inside our sensors, to read our communications, to hear what we're saying to each other. If in fact we are in that hot conflict, and I'll ask you to believe me on that, what I worry about is that we're not having the urgency I think we need. Look, you can tell I'm a passionate person, right? You can tell that I jump out of bed every day to do what I do. But what I would love to see from industry and government together is that agility and urgency that we saw. You know, there was a time uh, actually, when I was in Iraq, and I think you might have been there too at that moment, we were dealing with um, explosively formed projectile threats to the underbelly of the vehicles. And some of my people who would later be my colleagues at General Dynamics, I had never met them at the time, sat down with the two-star, and uh, the two-star said, look, soldiers are dying. We need, a, we need an answer today. And they sketched out a, a, um, a design for a different hull for the vehicles, and they went back to the plant and they started working on it. And there was no question about, how am I gonna get paid for this? Are the requirements lying flat? Do we have all the contract terms? It was urgency to mission, and then we'll let everything else sort out along the way. Everybody's got lawyers, everybody's got contracts, people, we gotta worry about them. 
But I would love for all of us together to get back to that moment of urgency because I think we are in a hot war. Uh, so there is no transition is what you're saying. And, and that's the whole title of this panel and I'm really glad he challenged that because uh, I think there's a lot of what you say, there's a lot of truth in that. And so the question is, uh, you know, do we have our gloves off now or do we wait? So, okay, any final thoughts, uh, David, uh, closing remarks? And we'll just, just you know, come thanks down for the, the opportunity and, and we at GE, you know, we are not at the pointy end of the spear, but we're really proud of our, what we do to support and bring in the most capable products to those men and women who are at the pointy end of the spear because we don't want them going into a fair fight. We want it to be an unfair fight in their odds. And we just uh, are really proud of what the small piece we do to make that possible. Thank you again for the opportunity. You know, I'll uh, really focus my comments on, on the folks that are, that are in uniform, having come from the uniform, and, and being in a position to serve the customer I once was. You know, I'll share with you that um, you probably don't realize that you need just as many people outside of uniform as you do inside of uniform to help you be successful. And I would say I've taken that path. And I, and I, and I think as I think about uh, both uh, David and, uh, and Brian and, and on behalf of all of our industry partners out there, we truly are committed to one cause and one single mission. And I think people need to understand it. They need to um, recognize it. And, and using the, uh, the old African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And this peer competition will require us to go together. Long way to go. Okay, Brian. So uh, again, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I think sometimes I tend towards um, scaring people um, with the vision of the cyber warfare that we're in today. Um, and I guess I I'll leave you with some hopefulness, which is that I know the world is getting more dangerous. I got a four-year-old at home. I worry about the world he's gonna grow up in. Um, at the same time, I am 100% certain that when the chips are down, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and guardians are invariably the kind of people that rise to the challenge. And I want you to know that I get up every day to provide you the tools to meet that challenge. Uh, and I'm grateful that you are out there meeting that challenge for us. So thank you to all of you. Thank you, ma'am. No, thank you all for being here. And I'm sure when you, uh, when you walked in and we started talking about transitioning to a wartime posture and you have a lab commander and three industry panelists, you wondered, how is this going to be helpful to me? But I think uh, the team has demonstrated that there are a lot of great ideas and that together uh, we can make it happen. So would you please join me in a round of applause for our great panelists. <laughs>